What if it's true? Do I need to remind you what is out there? Once upon a time, I had somebody that I cared about. And in this world, that sort of shit's good for one thing. Getting you killed. I reckon it's got something to do with that girl. He's got everything to do with that little girl. You see, I believe everything happens for a reason. We don't have to do this. You know that, right? After all we've been through, everything that I've done, it can't be for nothing. Hey everyone, it's Soul here, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. A good story is a powerful thing, and a great one can go on to impact the lives of anyone and everyone that experiences it. And The Last of Us is undoubtedly one of the best stories to ever come from a video game. I would be lying if I said that this game and its story didn't impact me. A big reason that I started playing video games is because of this game. The reason that I started looking into the amazing worlds and characters in video games is because of this one. I can still remember the first time I stumbled upon PewDiePie's playthrough. <laughs> How's it going, bros? My name is PewDiePie. I was sucked into the world immediately. I was so captivated by how a video game that is full of action, full of gunfights and violence was able to create such an emotional and moving story that at the end of the day is a story about humanity complete with all of its complex emotions wrapped inside. It is because of this very game that I started playing video games in the first place, and in more ways than just one, this game has essentially changed my life. And I am just one of millions of examples that showcase the power that stories hold, and in particular, the power that this game's story has. The original game was a huge success and has since gone on to have a part two to its story, as well as have HBO adapt a TV show from it. Yet, on its own, the game's storytelling capabilities are still vastly impressive. Having just recently replayed both the original game and the DLC for the first time in quite a while, and with the game being just shy of 11 years old by now, I am absolutely shocked at how every single word has such a deep and important meaning to the overall story. The precision and the attention to detail is outstanding and every single moment is crucial in pulling us into the lives and the changes of our main characters. So I just want to revisit and talk about this game and why I feel that The Last of Us is a masterpiece and a testament to the art of storytelling. As always, please remember to hit that like button, click subscribe to see more videos from me, and leave a comment down below. Here is your one and only warning that this video contains spoilers. Alright, grab your comic books, load your revolvers, and let's sprint into it. Written by Neil Druckmann and produced at Naughty Dog Studios, The Last of Us came out back in 2013 for the PS3. The visuals of the game as a whole are incredible, and I would argue that they still hold up pretty well to this day. The detail in these general settings of this overgrown world that is familiar and yet so different from our current one, it's just such a fun environment to play in. By using some of the best mocap systems available to them at the time, the game created some outstanding graphics and renderings of the talented actors' performances. I want to just take this time to acknowledge the talented actors and actresses that were part of this game, but more specifically, I want to acknowledge Troy Baker and Ashley Johnson. From all of us fans of the game, thank you for giving your all to these characters and bringing Joel and Ellie to life. The story is so rooted in the emotions of our two main characters, and if it wasn't for your talent and dedication, the end result would have never been as successful. So from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for being a part of this game. Aside from the talented cast and the beautiful graphics, the game has a memorable and emotional soundtrack. It has its peaks of intensity and action, but it's carefully crafted to reflect our characters and their story. It's really fantastic. 
At the time of its release, The Last of Us was a groundbreaking game in terms of showcasing how the narrative story can, in fact, take the lead in driving the game forward while still being blended in with the stereotypical gaming aspects. While the game certainly does an outstanding job with this blend, it isn't the first game to do this, so why is it often considered this groundbreaking game, one that broke barriers in relation to narrative storytelling? Well, a big part of that obviously has to do with the story itself, and we will go on to talk about how this game focuses more on the characters themselves rather than the events going on around them. But I do feel like a portion of the game's early on success was partially advanced with the help of YouTube. I know I say this a lot in some of my other videos, but I think it's so important because it's very easy for us to forget the impact that YouTube had back in the day. Video games in general had started to grow to a larger and larger audience through the internet, with PewDiePie going on to gain the most subscribed YouTuber achievement and title just a couple of months after playing The Last of Us. There were many other YouTube gaming channels that were being established at this time, and in general, a lot of the original YouTubers, mainly the ones I'm thinking of were the sort of original British YouTubers, went on to create specific gaming channels within the next couple of years from the release of The Last of Us. This went on to expose video games to a whole new set of people. On top of just reaching this brand new audience, The Last of Us was released at a time where Happy Wheels, Minecraft, silly quick horror games, and first person shooters like Call of Duty were absolutely ruling the YouTube gaming space. The Last of Us created a unique and welcome change of pace with enough familiarity in it for all. It was high in energy and action, and yet it had emotional and cinematic moments. It held pockets of peace and serenity, and yet it always had terrors ready to jump out at you. You could stealth your way through the game, planning strategically, or you could just jump out guns blazing. It had something for almost every single person. You also have the general shock factor that the internet allowed at this time, in the sense that viewers wanted to see how people would react to the emotional introduction that this game has. Experiencing the death of Sarah is a heavy intro for the game, but in more ways than one, it does set us up on the path for the rest of the chaos and adventures that will unfold. With this being the sort of first video game to be driven by an emotional story, yet still be fast paced and full of action to reach this brand new audience on YouTube, and to reach others that might just be getting tired of the usual gaming content at this time, I think all of this combined is why the game sort of became known as a groundbreaking game, simply because it was the first one to do all of this on YouTube. Of course, the story itself does push the boundaries in a lot of ways that we will talk about moving forward, but I just find the reach that this game had at the time to be so fascinating, admirable, and a part of why the game had gained its early success. But the reality is, even with this sort of circumstances of YouTube's timing aiding that success, it would be absolutely nothing if it wasn't for the masterfully written and uniquely emotional and complex story. The game has a strong focus on our two main characters and every single line of dialogue and every scene plays a part in showcasing how our main characters change throughout the events that occur around them. In The Last of Us, you play as a character by the name of Joel Miller, who is first shown to us at the start of this sort of zombie outbreak. Playing briefly through the point of view of his daughter Sarah, we start the game assuming that she will be our main character but this is where the story takes its first turn. Sarah is killed while in Joel's arms in a stressful, then turned heartbreaking introduction to the game. This is probably the most brutal, heavy, and intense intros in any story that I've ever encountered. Sarah. Move your hands, baby. I know, baby, I know. God. Sarah. And yet, it is in this introduction that so many themes for the game are revealed. The idea of the unpredictability and danger of humans in this new world is probably the biggest revelation. It's not the infected that kill Sarah, it's the soldier. And as you continue the game, the idea of humans being a sort of loose cannon is focused on a lot. Throughout the game, you never truly know if you could trust any human that you meet in this game. This scene not only sets us up as a player to sort of mirror Joel's feelings towards other humans in this world, 
but it also does a great job portraying what these circumstances of this newfound infected world have created for humanity. It's a place where you can't trust anyone because every single person is trying to do all that they can to survive for themselves. The gameplay sections throughout the rest of the game also show how humans are the more dangerous and unpredictable creatures since a lot of the sections where you encounter infected feel almost a smidge easier since the infected tend to walk in a lot more of a strict pattern while the humans, well, they're unpredictable. I would also like to add that this introduction is just a masterclass in how to write quick characterization. If you are a writer or are interested in how they are able to get you to bond with Sarah so quickly and effectively, take some time to study this scene because it is truly amazing how they are able to do this before she is eventually killed in less than 20 minutes later. After Sarah's death, the game then jumps ahead 20 years into the future. Through the transitional credits, we learn that a rebellion group called the Fireflies is actively trying to save the world from the restraints of the military that is created within these active quarantine zones across the country. In a world where everyone is doing absolutely anything they can just to fight for themselves to survive, a cold, stoic, and self-centered Joel is now introduced to us. Focusing in on only his and Tess's needs, the two live together as smugglers trusting no one else. When going to get even with a guy by the name of Robert, we get our inciting incident in this story as they end up being forced to strike up a deal with the leader of the Fireflies, Marlene, where they are to smuggle something out of the city. But that something turns out to be a young girl by the name of Ellie. Being around the same age as Sarah and having a talkative and caring and fun personality as well, one can't help but be reminded of Joel's daughter. Yet, Joel takes every single opportunity to ignore and minimize any conversations to be had with Ellie. As they leave the city, Ellie is revealed to be immune to the infection, which explains why she had to be smuggled out before the trio run into some trouble along the way with infected. Tess is sadly bit, and when they realize that the military tracked them out of the city, she sacrifices her life in order to let Joel and Ellie escape, and with her last moments, she makes one last request. She saw that Ellie's immunity is real, and so she begs Joel to get Ellie to the Fireflies in order to find the world a cure. I'm not doing that. Yes, you are. Look, there's enough here that you have to feel some sort of obligation to me, so you get her to Tommy's. No, no, just go! Honoring her last words, Joel takes Ellie to Bill's town in hopes to find a car so that he can find his brother who might know where the Fireflies are. While with Bill, the game does its sort of first example of how they use both named and unnamed characters to create a sense of humanity and depth to both the individual side characters as well as the world as a whole. Bill is revealed to be so much more than just a doomsday prepper. Through a few scattered notes that you can find around town and discovering his partner dead and hanging in one of the houses with the stolen car battery that Joel needs, Bill is now shown as a man who struggled in his relationship, a man who loved and cared deeply for his partner who is now lost to the cruel circumstances of the world that they all live in. He was my partner. He's got bites. Here. The notes that you find throughout the entire game do a wonderful job at creating complexity to the characters and by showcasing the absolute chaos and sadness that this world creates. This moment is one of the many reminders the game gives us that this is a world that is not a safe place and happiness is often lost to its cruel circumstances. After getting the car, Joel and Ellie begin to bond ever so slightly as Ellie makes a joke about a specific sort of substance you might find on adult magazines. Why are these all stuck together? With a growing sense of comfort and joking between the two of them, they go on to listen to some old music during their drive. But their peaceful drive is soon interrupted as they get attacked by hunters in Pittsburgh. It is here that the pair reach a new level of connection as Ellie goes on to save Joel's life when they are reunited after a brief section of separation caused by Joel falling down an old elevator shaft. 
Angered by the situation that just unfolded, Joel lashes out at Ellie, yelling at her while she fights back, saying that he should be thanking her. He should be comforting her after her first kill. This is the first time she's ever killed another human being. And Joel just brushes it off as if she did something wrong. I'm glad I didn't get my head blown off by a goddamn kid. You know what? No. How about, hey, Ellie, I, I know it wasn't easy, but it was either him or me. Thanks for saving my ass. You got anything like that for me, Joel? We gotta get going. Lead the way. It's an interesting moment in the character's dynamic, and there's a lot of people that like to analyze this section as Joel showing a bit of his self-hatred, which I do find to be very fascinating and also very fitting towards his character. He is yelling at Ellie, but he is actually really mad at himself. He is frustrated that he let it get to this point where Ellie had to pick up a gun and shoot another person. But whatever the true reason is behind his anger, this is brushed off before Joel eventually ends up trusting Ellie ever so slightly. Joel gives Ellie a rifle and has her help fight the hunters as they make their way through the city. This cold and self-centered Joel that we saw previously, with his walls built up high, has finally begun to crack in the slightest as he trusts Ellie for the first time ever. He no longer sees her as just cargo like he did earlier. Just cargo, Joel. Running around the city, Ellie and Joel meet Henry and Sam, brothers that are trying to cross through the city that are also on the run from these hunters. Seeing that they each have children right about the same age, Joel and Henry agree to work together to escape the city and once again, Joel's wall begins to crack ever so slightly as he trusts these random strangers. There is a great moment in which the group is escaping through the bridge, but a ladder breaks as Joel tries to climb up it. Since he is the last one up, Henry acts on his instinct to survive and leaves Joel behind. It really helps showcase the overall selfishness of humans in this world, and yet Ellie, unlike Sam and Henry, ignores her survival instincts and jumps down, trusting Joel with her life. The pair eventually escape before meeting back up with Henry and Sam, and Joel's cracks are starting to show even more as he very swiftly forgives and goes on to trust Henry and Sam once more. Henry has to watch over Ellie and Joel has to watch over Sam by an accident in the tunnels before he intentionally leaves Ellie under Henry's care in the neighborhood section as they rush through the town. I think Joel having Henry watch over Ellie in this section as he goes to try and flank this sniper was actually a really cool way to symbolize his growing trust of strangers, in particular, his growing trust of Sam and Henry. When they finally get to the hideout, Joel laughs and jokes around with Henry and is starting to open up to having other people around. But the next morning, they wake up to find that Sam is actually infected. He attacks Ellie, but Henry kills his younger brother before he eventually kills himself. This is nobody's fault, Henry. It's all your fault! Henry! Henry, no! Oh my god. Without a single word uttered between the pair, we jump ahead with Ellie and Joel to the fall. We see the pair wandering around through the woods in hopes to find Joel's brother, Tommy. As they walk, their limited dialogue suggests a growing sense of comfort between them. They are seen high-fiving, and Joel even tells Ellie briefly about his past relationship with Tommy. But this is also the scene where we start to see Ellie's first signs of her character change that she goes through in this game. Ellie starts off as someone who is very talkative. She wants to talk about the past. She is constantly pushing Joel to tell her about his own past, and she, in this very moment that they stumble upon a child-sized grave, she wants to talk about Sam and Henry's death. Yet, she quickly, and with little resistance, accepts Joel's plan to shut it down and not talk about things to just move on. It's quite a sharp contrast to her loud and rambling response after Tess's death back in Boston. I can't believe we did that! One thing that I want to point out is that the time jumps in the game as a whole perfectly showcase this growing sense of shutting down and moving on. 
Throughout the entire game, the time jumps always happen after a huge and often traumatic moment, and it really encapsulates how the pair never truly resolve their feelings on these matters. They both just keep internalizing things so that they can move on to what they grow to hope is a happier place where they can both live peacefully together. The pair find Tommy, and as the brothers reunite, Joel makes the surprising request and asks Tommy to take Ellie the rest of the way to the Fireflies. Tommy resists this idea since he has made a new life for himself building up this town and even getting married to Maria. But after seeing how Ellie and Joel interact, Tommy agrees to do this. I absolutely love this brief scene, and I love that we are seeing this while focused on Tommy. It's his moment of realization that Joel is scared to lose Ellie just like he lost Sarah. Tommy sees the growing connection between the two of them and as a way to sort of save his brother from a potential loss, he agrees. I also like to think that he might also have some feelings of guilt over Sarah's death as well. He was the one that shot the soldier and saved Joel's life, but I would imagine that thoughts of how he should have been there earlier and that he should have saved Sarah, that guilt must creep in sometimes. This is never confirmed or truly mentioned, but I can't help but think it would cross his mind in this very moment. I have to do this. I don't know what else to say. Ellie, overhearing of Joel's plan to leave her to Tommy, runs off into the woods, leaving Joel and Tommy to chase after her. When Joel eventually finds her, the pair finally argue, they finally confront their fears for the first time in the entire game, with Ellie being true to her character that we saw in the beginning of the game, since she is the one that is really pushing and driving this confrontational moment forward. It is an emotional moment as Ellie is feeling betrayed and disappointed in Joel. She begs him to admit that he just wanted to get rid of her the entire time, it's as if she's asking him to admit that he never truly cared about her, and Joel evades the question by trying to lie to both Ellie and himself that Tommy will protect her better. I take care of myself. How many close calls have we had? Well, we seem to be doing all right so far. And now you'll be doing even better with Tommy. Joel's feelings of self-hatred and his lack of trust in his abilities to protect Ellie is definitely coming forward in this exact moment as he tries to convince himself that Ellie would be better off with Tommy, even though he doesn't really seem to want that. Ellie calls Joel out on his fear of losing her, on his fear of her ending up just like Sarah. Not her, you know. What? Maria told me about Sarah. Ellie? And you are treading on some mighty thin ice here. Before Joel shuts down once again, stating how he is not Ellie's father and she is definitely not his daughter. Yet, before they can truly resolve their explosive discussion, they are attacked and interrupted. Similar to how the timing of the cutscenes work, this interruption creates no true outspoken resolution to their current issues. After they end up fighting the enemies and they approach the town of Jackson, Joel changes his mind and he decides to take Ellie the rest of the way. In many ways, I see Joel to be sort of giving in at this very moment. It's as if he can't lie to himself anymore. He cares for Ellie and he wants to be there to protect her. The wall has come down, yet he won't cross the threshold. He won't admit that the connection's there. But at least at this point, he's not necessarily opposing it. He's not fighting to keep her out anymore. A minor time jump later, and Ellie and Joel are exploring the university where the Fireflies are presumed to be. Their conversations are casual, comfortable, and Joel is actually opening up even more as he talks of wanting to have been a singer, and more surprisingly, he opens up a little bit about Sarah and Sarah's mother. They end up finding the university abandoned before they get the information needed to get the Firefly's new location, before they are yet again attacked by another group of people. Joel is gravely injured in their escape from the university, and we have a sudden and nerve-wracking cut to Ellie being alone in the wintertime. Joel? Joel? Shit. Joel, here. Oh, get up, get up. You gotta tell me what to do. Come on. You gotta get up. Joel. 
I have to say, them refraining from having us play as Ellie up until this moment is really effective. We truly believe that Joel is dead. We as players mourn the loss of Joel as we try to hunt for food in order to keep Ellie alive. It isn't until we meet David and Ellie asks for medicine that we have the tiniest hope that Joel is still alive. Ellie's section of gameplay being alone with David, I think it's just so well done. We play as Ellie as she wants to trade the deer for medicine, as her and the stranger David fight off a group of infected. As the man arrives with medicine, David reveals that he's been hunting a crazy man that killed some of his men while they were out scouting and this man travels with a young girl. He was out there this entire time looking for Ellie and Joel. Said that the others had been uh, slaughtered by a crazy man. And get this, he's a crazy man traveling with a little girl. There's this sinking feeling in your stomach as you realize that now they are in trouble. Ellie is outnumbered and Joel is severely injured and it is just a terrifying threat and moment. Until I replayed it, I actually forgot how long Ellie and David's interaction is before this grand realization. The game really makes you feel that you can trust David. You fight off a giant group of infected together, you're sneaking around through a maze of infected while he waits there for you to show up, and you sort of have this final boss moment with the bloater coming down and attacking. I also find that at this point in the game, we are coming off of a period of good characters. The most recent named characters, Maria, Tommy, Henry, and Sam, they were all good. You as a player trusted them, so it makes it almost too easy to want to trust David the first time you play the game. And all of that makes the eventual reveal of him being evil a lot more impactful and horrifying. Ellie gives Joel the medicine. You're gonna make it. Foreseeing that David has tracked her down to where she's hid Joel. While trying to divert the group away from the injured Joel, she tries to flee the town but is captured by David. It is here that we learn that David and his group are cannibals, and he himself has some really predatory tendencies. And you're special. Oh. Ellie is in serious danger, and we see her try to make a failed escape before she successfully escapes her prison cell, but as she escapes and runs through the town, there is this insane amount of danger, threat, and tension on the scene. Knowing all of this, the player is then forced to control Joel as you race to try and find her and save her. The urgency and the fears are high before we get to this major event. In this great blizzard, you feel Ellie's fear. She has no clue where to go. You can't see anything. Which way is out? Which way is safe? She doesn't know if Joel is even dead or alive. The chaos inside of her is portrayed on the outside with this blizzard. And the same situation goes for Joel. He doesn't know where Ellie is or if she's even still alive. This section of gameplay is packed full with tension and urgency before Ellie has to fight for her life and is forced to kill David in a brutal way, with Joel arriving just a smidge too late to save her. As Ellie fights his arms briefly, not knowing that it's him, she breaks down when she sees that he is alive, and out of fear and frustration of everything that has just happened, Ellie breaks, and a part of her is forever lost. It's me! It's me! It's me! Look! Look! It's me. He tried to... Oh, baby girl. It's okay. It's okay. Joel. It's okay. Joel consoles her and he calls her baby girl, just as he called Sarah in the beginning of the game. With this subtle acknowledgement from Joel and Ellie's true feelings on full display without her comedic front and without her being so open and confrontational like she was before... This is the moment that they become father and daughter. But then, following the trend of never resolving the problems after major events, we get yet another time jump. We see Ellie zoning out while staring at a picture of a deer on the highway in the spring. With the image of the deer right in front of us, one can't help but think that she is remembering the traumatic events of the winter. 
When asked what is wrong, she ignores the question and avoids conversation. Ellie's transition to someone that hides her feelings and shuts down is definitely growing stronger and becoming a bit more apparent. Joel even realizes that Ellie is distant, but you sort of get the feeling that he just wants to finish things so that they can return back to Tommy's together instead of trying to fix everything right now. Ellie also shows a bit of a sense of urgency in order to get things done, but not for the same reason as Joel. Ellie has clearly been struggling with survivor's guilt all this time, but with them being so close to finding the fireflies and maybe finding a cure for the infection, her desire to do it and the guilt she feels for surviving is certainly getting stronger. Her line of it all has to be worth something, and even her dream about the plane going down and her trying to fly it in order to save everyone on it portrays this sort of internal struggle with her survivor's guilt, but also her growing savior complex. She feels as if she has to do this. It is her sole purpose in life to save the world from the infection. But this pressure is building up inside of Ellie, creating a lot of inner turmoil. And I think most of the dialogue in this section portray that. Joel, seeing this struggle inside of Ellie, tells her that they don't have to go through with this, but Ellie, feeling the weight of her responsibilities and pressure that the immunity has brought her, says that they need to see it through. We don't have to do this. You know that, right? <sighs> What's the other option? Go back to Tommy's. Just be done with this whole damn thing. After all we've been through. Everything that I've done. It can't be for nothing. As the pair find the fireflies, or rather the fireflies find them, Joel is knocked out before he wakes up in the hospital with Marlene sitting next to him. She tells Joel that Ellie is getting prepped for surgery in order to make a vaccine that saves the world. But Joel is also told that Ellie will not survive. Not willing to lose another daughter and not being able to have seen her or spoke to her about everything that's going on, Joel goes on to kill every single firefly in the hospital in one of the most emotionally complex and heavily debated moral dilemmas in any story. Did he do the right thing? Should he have killed everyone and prevented a cure for the infection just to save Ellie's life? Well, I'll let you guys debate about this because this topic is constantly being discussed online, and I do think that there are some strong arguments to be made for both sides. There's a great video done by Jay's Reviews, I'll link it down below, but I think he did a great job explaining all of the nuance to this moral question. Me personally, I do find it to be a very fitting conclusion for Joel's character. Despite all of his growth and the wall coming down, allowing him to trust strangers again, Ellie has become the thing that he fights for, his reason to live and not just survive. He is willing to do absolutely anything for this person that he loves, and so he does it. He slaughters nearly all of the fireflies and he kills Marlene on sight before driving back to Jackson, determined to give him and Ellie a happier and safer life. I love the way that they set up this sort of driving scene since you don't truly know what he did for a brief moment in the game. His conversation with Marlene as he tries to flee with Ellie is intercut with Joel driving away which creates the mystery of, is Ellie alive? Did he actually leave her with Marlene to create a cure? And for a second you don't really know. But then Ellie wakes up in the back seat. We are then set up for one of the best endings in any story ever. This right here is how you do a cliffhanger. Joel lies to Ellie, saying that the Fireflies gave up on a cure. He lies to her in hopes that she will be able to move on from her ideas and struggles of survivor's guilt and her savior complex that she has sort of developed from her immunity. He wants her to move on so that they can live happily together in Jackson. Yet, Ellie can't shake the feeling of something being wrong. As you end the game, you play as Ellie as the pair walk through the woods just outside of Jackson, where Ellie confronts Joel. She opens up to him about how when she was bit, she wasn't alone in Boston. Her friend Riley, who in the DLC is actually revealed to be a bit more than just a friend, was sadly bit and had died. 
Going on to list everyone else that we have come to know in the game that died of the infection, Ellie's survivor's guilt is laid out in full, and Joel tries his best to push the responsibility off of Ellie's shoulder and to teach her that she will find something else to fight for like he has done as well. But then she asks him to swear that everything he said about the fireflies no is true. What, you keep finding something to fight for. Now, I know that's not what you want to hear right now. Swear though, to me. Swear to me that everything that you've said about the fireflies is true. I swear. She wants him to tell her once more that her life does not have a purpose in saving this world, and he swears it before she responds with a simple okay. Yet the look in her eyes and the uneasy music shows how unsteady this lie is. She is doubtful in his words, and we are left with so much uncertainty as we end the game. It is actually an incredible moment that we just cut to black as Ellie looks so uncertain and saddened in her eyes. The ending gives me chills every single time. She knows that he's not being truthful, but it's as if she doesn't wish to acknowledge it. She wants the happy life with Joel just as he does, and yet she just knows that his words aren't fully true. But her development, her gradual shift to shutting down and simply moving on, has solidified in this scene as she takes his words at their surface level and is ready to try and just move on from this past. It's so clear that her old self, her talkative and open self, is battling with this new and distant version of her. Even in this scene alone, she opens up about her past with Riley, something that she's never told anyone about, but she ends the conversation with a simple, short, one word and cold answer symbolizing her development through the entire game in this final scene. Beautiful little details like this are what put this game on a different level of storytelling capabilities, and the more I play it, the more playthroughs that I rewatch, the more details that I find that make me admire the story and the writing even more. I have so much appreciation for the premise of the story, and I will forever find the precise and attentive execution of it to be a masterclass in storytelling and character development. I definitely found myself much more focused on Ellie's changes in this recent playthrough, which was a bit intentional as I am gearing up to replay through the second game, but I absolutely loved focusing on her and experiencing the almost opposition with Joel gradually opening up the entire time while Ellie is slowly shutting down. The pacing of these shifts is perfectly placed and every single line of dialogue plays a part in their respective changes. There is not a single moment of filler content in this entire game, and if you think that a line is irrelevant now, just wait until we talk about the sequel, because I can promise you, every single thing has a purpose. It's insanely impressive that the writers are able to pull all of this off. The story is definitely unique, since it really hones in, like I've said before, on our characters rather than the events around them. The heavy emphasis on every little thing that changes their personality or changes their relationship dynamic is admirable and it's really a skill that many writers still struggle with. It's very easy to get caught up in the action and the world itself of a video game rather than the characters, so the fact that this game really focuses in on them is impressive. I think the optional dialogue interactions help create this focus in a very natural way while we get to walk around and still sort of explore the world without it feeling like a separate cutscene for every single moment of interaction. It's a great balance and blend that also aids in the immersive nature of this game. I love the moral dilemma that we get at the end, but I do think that this sort of idea extends to a lingering question of should you be killing these random people throughout the entire game? Ellie and Joel are constantly faced with these apparent kill or be killed scenarios, and yes, from our view as the main characters trying to survive, of course these people are our enemies. It is this selfish and self-centered world that is full of kill or be killed situations, but what I find fascinating is how both Ellie and Joel have a past that equalizes them with the people they are seen killing. 
starting with one of the earliest enemies, the military. Well, Ellie herself was in military school. It's briefly mentioned in the main game and is obviously discussed a bit more in the DLC where we see her escaping from military school in general, but Ellie would have presumably become part of the military if she wasn't bit. Through Riley's dialogue, we know that Marlene wouldn't take Ellie into the Fireflies and the only reason Marlene accepted her was because she was bit and immune. Ellie, that was the first thing I asked Marlene. She wants you safe at that stupid school. I'm not even supposed to come see you. Why does she care? She's worried I'll get you into trouble. Whatever. So it's interesting to think that if things had been different, she could have become one of the very people that Joel could kill in the beginning of the game. As for Joel, he never truly hides the fact that he is a bad person with a dark past. When encountering the hunters in Pittsburgh, Ellie asks Joel how he knew the guy wasn't hurt, and it's implied that Joel was once part of a group that used to use the same tricks and possibly did the exact same things to innocent people. So, uh, you kill a lot of innocent people? <sighs> then, in another nod to show a sense of sameness amongst the group, Tommy was known as a firefly, so it's hard to imagine the fireflies as true enemies rather than just people. There are all of these constant reminders that while the group of people they are fighting are certainly bad in these circumstances, they are still humans just trying to survive like Joel did in his past, like Tommy did in his past too, and like Ellie probably would have done in her future had she not been bit. It really adds to the overarching moral dilemma that we are focusing in on at the end of the game. This story and the events that happen, they are just an emotional roller coaster. The game itself is insanely immersive and you as a player feel every single up and down that this game has to offer. You feel when Joel and Ellie are having a good time and they are bonding together. You feel when they are running around looking for each other, panicked that the other one might not be alive. There's many times that the game also switches very quickly from an emotional scene to one full of action or vice versa. I love the quick switches because it does often show how Joel and Ellie never really resolve their issues since they just have to move on in order to survive, but it also mirrors the chaos of this world wonderfully. All of the little notes that portray the many stories of both named and unnamed characters really aids into the general world building and immersion that this game does a fantastic job with if you as a player do wish to read and search for all of the clues. I already spoke briefly about Bill's notes that gives his and Frank's relationship just a bit more context, but the most memorable set of notes has to be the story of Ish. As you leave Pittsburgh, you experience his story and he is a man who goes on to save so many people and create this underground settlement that you venture through with Henry and Sam. The safe haven eventually fell to infection and we get brutal accounts of the chaos. It is a section of gameplay that firstly creates a sense of terror and fear, being trapped not only with infected, but also with Ellie and Joel being separated due to the circumstances of the tunnels. But this section also creates heavy amounts of loss and sadness for the humans that were once happy there, the very humans that you read about in the notes. In many ways, I think that this section foreshadows things to come, but it ultimately encaptures the harsh and cruel realities of this now infected world. You might be happy for a little while, like Bill and Frank were, like Ellie and Riley were, like Joel and Tess were, like the settlement that was run by Ish was as well. But one way or another, whether it's through the infected that we are fighting in this section and the infection that takes Sam away from us in a few scenes later, and the infection that took Tess from us in the beginning of the game, or if it's through the cruelty of the unpredictability of humans like we see in Pittsburgh before and after this section, like we saw with Sarah getting killed in the beginning, and like we saw with the fireflies as they are about to kill Ellie at the end of the game, this world does not allow for any sort of permanent happy endings, no matter how badly our characters and us as players might want them. This is also why Joel and Ellie don't get to have a truly happy ending. Their relationship moving forward is built on a lie, and in some morbid and twisted way, it is a very fitting and perfect ending to this ultimately sad yet very human story. 
With the complexity of human emotions, the ideas of survivor's guilt and grief on full display, and ending with a huge moral dilemma in a chaotic and unpredictable world, the story of Ellie and Joel is truly a masterpiece. It's a moving story that has a multitude of takeaways, since there are so many emotions that players can sort of latch onto and relate with. You have the idea of found family, the meaning of love and sacrifice, finding a purpose and reason to fight to survive, and not just to survive, but to also want to live. Struggles with PTSD are present, avoidance issues, depression, and so much more ideas and heavy emotions are explored in this game, with the moral dilemma being caused by ultimately an act of love. The game's ability to fit in all of these heavy topics in a game that is ultimately very violent and action-heavy is always and forever impressive to me, and with all of this in mind, that is why this story in this game is and will be a masterpiece. I wish I could talk about the sequel right now, because I already have so many thoughts and a newfound appreciation for the game, but I think I want to leave this a spoil-free video, so I guess you can consider this a part one. I could probably talk about this game forever, there's still so much to unpack, there's a lot of great writing details that I think are a great lesson in showing how to write character development and growth, and I am forever in awe of this story and how it is told with such precision. I might do a more focused breakdown for some of those particular moments, namely I'm thinking about the introduction sequence since it's just so impressive to me, but we'll see what I end up doing. If you guys made it this far into the video, leave a little horse emoji in honor of our trusty steed, Callus. If you like my discussion, please remember to hit that like button down below and leave your thoughts in the comment section. I would love to hear your thoughts on the ending, did Joel do the right thing, or perhaps it's not the right thing, but was it the human thing to do or not? Let me know all of your thoughts as usual, and while you're down there, click subscribe to see more videos from me, and turn on notifications if you want to be notified whenever I post a new video. Thanks for watching everyone, and I will see you future souls next time. Bye guys!